So our last presenting company before uh, bio break is Sangamo Biosciences. Uh, Sangamo is a biopharmaceutical company focused on developing and harnessing the power of DNA binding proteins for large areas of uh, unmet need. When you think of Sangamo, uh, think of Biomarin merged with a platform technology like Sarepta, except better. Uh, presenting for the company is uh, Edward Lamphier, CEO and uh, President. Thank you, Ren. That's a, that's a kind introduction. I like that. I have to write, exactly, write that down. Um, all right. I, uh, 15 minutes, they've asked me to be faster than that. I can do that. Um, but I also, more than likely, I took it out. I didn't take it out. Um, so I'm going to flip through these slides, Ren, very quickly, because what we talked about is actually just having a conversation and, and, and doing that. So the presentation will contain forward-looking statements, refer to our forms 10K, 10Q. So the thing that I'm going to focus on and the platform element of what uh, Ren just talked about is our core technology in being able to engineer a naturally occurring class of proteins, zinc finger proteins. These are proteins that exist in all of us. As a matter of fact, they're one of the most common proteins in our whole genome. And the reason is, is because that's the, that's the software that our genomes use to turn on and turn off genes in a specific way. And what we've been able to do is harness that bring it into the laboratory and apply it for whatever gene we want, and then use that to drive different biologies from the DNA level. And I'll say more about that in a moment. So that's the core competency. Our goal is apply this in, in the area of therapeutics, and that's what I'm really gonna talk about. So just one very quick uh, cartoon, if you will, on the kinds of outcomes that we're interested in. We can use the technology as the left-hand side of the slide suggests to turn on or turn off gene regulation. And our most advanced effort in, in this area right now is in the area of repression, where we're shutting off one of the alleles, the disease-related allele, in Huntington's disease. On the right-hand side of the slide, and quite frankly, the area where we're doing the most in terms of stem cell biology, is our ability to target zinc finger nucleases to either stop a gene from being expressed permanently or to target the insertion or correction of endogenous genes. And I'll talk more about that in terms of the applications. But the technology itself is agnostic to the gene target. It's even agnostic to the host. And we've been quite successful, actually, in monetizing the technology both in the area of therapeutics but also outside. So a broad partnership with Dow Chemical in the area of plants, broad partnership with Sigma Aldrich in research reagents and transgenic animals, and our first major partnership with Shire. This is in the area of monogenic diseases in hemophilia and Huntington's disease. But the main effort for us is really to, to drive this in terms of its platform nature and therapeutics. And so this is a cartoon, and Ren, we can come back to this if you like, in terms of talking about where we're applying the platform and, and what we're doing. So the left-hand side, this ability to think about that toolbox, we can use this in vivo, and the, and the most active activity there, as I mentioned, is in the area of hemophilia and other protein replacement agents where we can permanently insert the correct gene, in this case, into the liver, and get permanent expression at therapeutic levels of that protein. This is our in vivo protein replacement platform. I mentioned Huntington's in terms of direct. And then on an ex vivo basis, we're applying this technology in differentiated cells, particularly CD4 T cells, but also in progenitors in, in CD34. Our most advanced effort there is also in, in HIV as well as in hemoglobinopathies. And again, happy to come back to all of these. But all of these have the basic goal of not just developing another treatment for a given disease. They all have as their goal of actually engineering genetic cures. And that's really on the far side here of the, of the slide. You can see the objective of all these programs. And so hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about these. Our HIV program is our most advanced effort. That's in phase two trials. These others are, are preclinical. But all of them, because of the platform nature of the technology, allow us to drive biology in a way that the goal is genetic cures. Um, last slide before summarizing. This just gives you a sense of where we are in the development process. Two ongoing phase two trials in our HIV program. Hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about that in, in a moment. 
uh, with data coming out in a preliminary data coming out in a month at the American Society of Cell and Gene Therapy in, in Salt Lake. And then uh, four new INDs next year, and then three new INDs following that. So quick summary of the, of the company, and then uh, delighted to uh, get us back on time and, and, and take some questions. So the, the core competency, and, and if ultimately we are successful, it really is a function of, of the unique technology and the kinds of biologies that we can drive. The goal isn't just uh, uh, the next level of, of therapeutic development. The goal is really to change the course of medicine in many of these diseases, and that is generate cures for these, uh, for these rare diseases as well as infectious diseases. So to date, very positive data in our HIV program. As I said, more data coming out in, in four weeks at ASGT. Um, the in vivo protein replacement platform is really intended to insert the correct gene for any of these protein replacements into the albumin locus and get therapeutic levels on a permanent basis. And then uh, preclinical programs in both Huntington's as well as in sickle cell and beta thalassemia, both uh, progressing very well. So all of that adds up to uh, completing these phase two trials this calendar year and seven new INDs over the next three years. And very, very importantly, because of our partnerships, and particularly the partnership with Shire, we're in a very strong financial position. We started this year with about $75 million in cash, and we are directionally looking at ending 2015, so three years from, from beginning of this year, with approximately $45 million in cash. So over that three-year period, because of our business model, only about a $30 million burn. And that's the last point I'll make in terms of the strategy, a business model for partnering as well as proprietary programs, but it is financed in a way that we think we can create a significant amount of value without having to um, go back and do dilutive financings. So, Rand, I'll stop there and, and uh, Come on and happy join to us discuss. down here. I think I'm yeah. wired up, so I should okay. be fine. Yeah, I am too, I think. So. That's all right. Yeah, I'm good. So um, maybe we can spend some minutes just talking about the platform because you mentioned it. Um, uh, you mentioned it up there. Clearly, there's an advanced product. There's data that's coming out um, very soon, so you probably can't talk too much about it. But but briefly, what can, what should investors be be focused on with that with that data set that that's coming out? Okay. So you want to talk about the platform or the HIV? Program? We'll start with the HIV and then okay. go to the platform and, okay. and see okay. what all your focus. So on. very quickly to summarize. So the the goal of the HIV program uh, focuses on uh, a well-validated target in HIV called CCR5. CCR5 is a receptor, a protein that's expressed on the surface of all CD4 T cells, and that's what HIV uses along with the CD4 receptors, so co-receptors, to infect T cells, destroy T cells, cause the loss of T cells, and, and leads eventually, if, if not treated, to these opportunistic infections. It's, um, there are, are lots of data to suggest that if you are missing or if a person is missing the CCR5 receptor, they don't get infected by the virus. And so our goal is to recapitulate that known human genotype and phenotype where you're missing both of the copies of your CCR5 gene or that's deleted. And so that's been the goal in our, in our T-cell program. And we are going to be presenting uh, in four weeks uh, the preliminary data from two ongoing phase two trials um, with that approach. And so to the approach just for this group is an autologous T cell therapy. We take patients, HIV patients, CD4 T cells out of the, of the patient, bring them into the laboratory, modify them with the zinc finger nuclease, characterize those cells in terms of release criteria. And this group more than others will uh, understand the need for the kinds of, of, of quality control and quality assurance testing that goes into autologous cell therapy. And then once released, those cells are infused back into the same patient. Uh, and the goal here is to create a compartment or an element of the immune system that has the sufficient or s characteristics in terms of anti-infective, anti-HIV infective capabilities, but also modified in a way that they can't be infected themselves so that if these patients ultimately go off their current therapy, their immune system can uh, address the virus and, and deplete the virus. Do you worry at all about that cell population taking over, uh, you know, the entire, the, the, your endogenous T cell population? That's there? No, I mean, no more so than when um, we respond to a vaccination or, you know, when we get uh, any kind of a viral infection. Uh, a percentage of our immune system 
Typically, if we've been vaccinated, the, the long-term central memory T cells, which are a small part of the immune, expand to target that, that particular antigen. And then what that, once that antigen is removed or gone, that becomes a, a, a small percentage. So uh, no, there's nothing in the preclinical data, and there's certainly nothing from a, a disease perspective that would suggest that these cells are going to have a differential advantage um, and would expand. So let's talk about the platform. Can it's, I say one thing, important. though, about that? They're, they're, even if that were true, there's work that's been done with stem cells, mm -hmm. so the so-called Berlin patient, where all, 100%, of his stem cells and then subsequent CD4 T cells are CCR5 negative. And, and has a perfectly normal immune system. Got it. So let's talk about the platform in the sure. remaining time. Um, you're, you, you, def, you have different mechanisms of action for this platform. Uh, what, are the, what are the indications that investors should be focusing on? Yeah, well, certainly the HIV is the most advanced yeah. clinically, and I'll sort of mentally work my way through that list of things. The, the, the area that we're collaborating uh, with Shire in, in the area of hemophilia, employs the zinc finger nucleases. So the ability to target with the zinc fingers a specific sequence of DNA and the nuclease component, this is the, 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 the delivery uh, payload, if you will, that we bring to that site in the genome, are enzymes, nucleases, that make a double-stranded break at that defined site. What we're able to do in the case of the HIV program is, is delete that gene or disrupt the expression. What we're doing in the area of these monogenic diseases is inserting at that site uh, a coding region, the full coding region, of a gene like factor IX or factor VIII or Gaucher's or Pompe's. The, the technology is agnostic to what we put in there. And what we've presented recently at ASH and then at, at a couple of, of other meetings is we are doing this with a small percentage of the albumin gene. We, in our livers, make about nine pounds of albumin a year. And if we were to co-opt one or two percent of that production with, say, a factor nine gene, we've shown in animal models that we can get 100 percent of normal circulating levels. And because we're inserting this in the endogenous gene, it's permanent. And that's really the goal of the Shire collaboration is to file an IMD on factor nine and factor eight in, in 2014, so next year. And then right behind that, for our own account, uh, two lysosomal storage disorder INDs in 2015. Uh, so that's one of the areas. The, the other direct in vivo uh, application that we've highlighted for investors is Huntington's disease. And that's something that investors should expect to hear quite a bit more about uh, in the second half of this year. It's going very, very well, and that's also funded by Shire. And then on the uh, ex vivo side of things, we've talked about the HIV T cell work. In the stem cell space, two programs that we expect to take into the clinic next year. One, employing the same CCR5 nucleases but in CD34 stem cells, so recapitulating that um, experiment that I just discussed, the so-called Berlin patient, but doing that in, in, in uh, hematopoietic progenitors. And then in hematopoietic progenitors of patients with sickle cell disease and or beta thalassemia, going in and modifying those genes in a way that once engrafted, we hope that that would be curative for either beta thalassemia or sickle cell. So those would be the, the seven... Uh, preclinical programs I'd highlight, and then the, um, the obviously the HIV phase two programs. So in the last minute that we have, you know, when we talk about curative therapies, um, that's it's uh, it makes maybe half the audience here very worried yeah. from a business model perspective. It's ambitious, right? Well, not just ambitious, but from a business model perspective, where you know we like to see our patients multiple times, we get to dose multiple times, and we get to make more revenues. How should we be thinking about? the business model for a curative therapy at, at Sangamo? Is it all just price? Can the payers afford this one-time payment? You know, how does the Dendrion... So, so Burl's a sponsor of this conference, right? So I can put in a shameless plug for your meeting <laughs> Feel free. Uh, in two weeks where I'm uh, sitting on a panel on pricing of, uh, of, of curative therapies, and, and so there's the shameless plug. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it, it is going to, it absolutely is going to require a completely new way of thinking about uh, reimbursement and, and pricing. And one of the things, just to cut to the chase, because there's lots of different models, but one of the things that... I think is, is both uh, responsible from a, um, I'll just say ethics point of view, but also digestible from a reimbursement point of view, is quite frankly to pay for performance. And so while there will be some cost to the reimbursement uh, groups up front, you're really going to see annualized or episodic payments based upon the durability 
and performance of these, quote, curative therapies. And that's going to be a delta from take hemophilia. How much of the, how much of the uh, uh, recombinant protein do they still have to take? Some? None? And what's the value of that going forward? And how long does that last? And I think that's going to be a more responsible and, and digestible way of thinking about pricing and reimbursement than, you know, seven-figure upfronts. Although, although we know that the, one of the first uh, uh, gene therapies that's now been approved in Europe is considering the six, seven-figure upfront right now. And Jorn is going to be on the panel with me in two weeks. There you go. <laughs> that's another, another panel that's uh, worthwhile exploring, especially when it comes to pricing. Thank you very much, Good Edward. Pleasure. Thanks very much.